Okay, so um, what we are looking at is uh, you know we are trying to understand the behavior at infinity okay and uh, somehow the idea is that if you want to study f of z at infinity then it is the same as studying f of 1 by z at 0 okay. So, so the question was uh, um, uh, why is this uh, uh, why is this justified uh, and well uh, I was trying to explain that in the uh, towards the end of the last lecture so I will take off from there. So let me let me go back to uh, what I was saying. Um, so you see uh, so the, the, the idea is uh, the idea is the following the idea is the following the idea is that you know whenever uh, two objects are isomorphic okay then their properties should correspond alright and uh, it is not only there for example if two topological spaces are isomorphic okay then you expect uh, both of them to have the same if uh, to have the same topological properties. So, if one has a certain topological property you should expect the same thing to happen of the other okay. So, for example, if, if one two, if two topological spaces are isomorphic one is connected then the other should also be connected. So, uh, a, a, a disconnected topological space cannot be isomorphic to a connected topological space because continuous image a continuous image of a connected set is connected okay and so on and so forth. So, uh, this, this is a very general philosophy in mathematics. For example, if two vector spaces are isomorphic you they then they will have the same dimension okay. So, so there the properties like dimension properties like uh, in topology properties like connectedness compactness these are all intrinsic properties okay and they are not supposed to change under isomorphisms. Now therefore, uh, so that is one level of uh, thinking the other level of thinking is that especially when you are looking at an isomorphism of spaces okay. Uh, it is not only that the the properties of the spaces geometric properties of spaces should uh, should correspond okay namely if one of the spaces has a geometric property then the other should also have and by geometry here of course I mean you know geometry is something that includes uh, uh, both uh, I mean uh, it includes topology it, in, in, it includes algebra it includes analysis it includes an interplay of all these properties okay. So, uh, so you expect if two objects are isomorphic you expect them to behave uh, in the same way uh, whether you, no matter whether you look at them topologically or algebraically or analytically okay and of course you should also assume that the, the isomorphism is also going to be compatible with whatever structure you are looking at uh, if if you are if you are if you are looking at topological properties the topological structure then you expect the isomorphism to be a topolo topological isomorphism which is a homeomorphism if you are looking at algebraic properties you should expect the uh, you, you should think of uh, an isomorphism which also you know uh, behaves well with the algebraic uh, structure and if you are looking at analytic properties for example if you are looking at uh, manifold theoretic properties then you should expect the uh, isomorphism to be an uh, isomorphism uh, that respects that structure. So, uh, now you see the, 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 the big deal is that uh, whenever two spaces are isomorphic then the functions on those spaces are also isomorphic. Okay. So, this is a very very important uh, idea. So, uh, uh, and functions are isomorphic in the sense that you know properties of functions carry over. So, so that is what I was trying to explain last time. So, so look at this uh, thing. Uh, so, x uh, phi from x to y is, uh, is a homeomorphism of topological spaces and, uh, and you are given this f which is a function uh, on uh, the topological space y with values in another topological space z. Okay. And I am just saying it is a function I am not saying that uh, I, I to begin with I do not know whether it is continuous or not okay. But the point is that the moment you give uh, it is it is very natural in set theory that whenever you give me a function on the target set you can compose it with the given map from the source set to the target set to get a function on the source set. So, uh, that is called the pullback of the function. So, you know f is a function on y you can compose it with phi to get this function g which is now a function on the source which is x okay and uh, then the question is that uh, what is the connection between f and g in, in fact f and g should correspond to one another in uh, this isomorph this isomorphism of spaces which induces an isomorphism of functions okay. So, uh, in fact you know the uh, what is happening is that there is a map from uh, uh, functions from y to z to functions from x to z that is a pullback map and what is happening is f is going to g. 
okay and this is an isomorphism because uh, because phi can because phi has an inverse okay this is an isomorphism and the fact is that under this isomorphism properties functions with properties uh, particular properties coincide so for uh, they, they correspond so for example uh, if f is continuous then g is continuous and uh, uh, the and conversely if g is continuous f is continuous because you can get f from g and g from f because phi is invertible okay now this is at the this is uh, this is at the topological level okay then uh, uh, i'm then i'm saying that let's look at it at a, at the level of complex analysis for example so suppose d1 and d2 are domains in the complex plane and phi from d1 to d2 is uh, is an analytic isomorphism namely it's a holomorphic map it's an analytic map which is injective okay and you know an injective holomorphic map is an isomorphism and then uh, our philosophy should tell us that the functions on d2 correspond they are in one to one correspondence with functions on d1 okay in particular if you are looking at complex valued functions on d2 they should be in bijective correspondence with uh, complex valued functions on d1 okay and that's again by the pullback so if you give me a function f uh, on d2 with complex values uh, then you know i get the pullback function g okay and f is uh, analytic if and only if g is analytic and and the the, and the reason for that is again the fact that phi uh, is invertible phi is analytic and you use the fact that the a composition of analytic functions is analytic okay so um, so now uh, now what i want want to do is that you can go one step further and you can discuss singularities so you know so so let me write this down so let us assume that you again have uh, this uh, uh, you have a you have a map from d1 to d2 phi is a map from d1 to d2 phi is a homeomorphism okay and uh, i am assuming that uh, uh, d1 and d2 are uh, 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 well uh, uh, they are uh, domains in the complex uh, plane okay and of course mind you i am i am i am i am being a little careful um, i am saying that phi is a homeomorphism i am not saying it's an uh, it's an isomorphism uh, it's a holomorphic isomorphism or analytic isomorphism but i say the following thing suppose phi takes uh, a point z0 in uh, d1 to a point w0 in d2 okay so i'm writing uh, the function phi as w is equal to phi of z okay z is the uh, is the is the independent variable it's supposed to vary in d1 okay and w is phi of z it's the dependent variable it's supposed to take values in d2 okay and i'm assuming that <coughs> phi takes z0 to w0 okay and suppose suppose that uh, you know uh, uh, phi from well uh, 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 suppose phi from d1 uh, to d2 uh, is actually an uh, 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 an analytic isomorphism so now i'm i'm you know uh, i'm assuming something more i am assuming that phi is not just a homeomorphism i am assuming it's a, an, an analytic isomorphism which means in particular it's a homeomorphism okay uh, mind you uh, an analytic map is continuous okay and therefore uh, an analytic isomorphism is stronger than being a homeomorphism okay <coughs> uh, well now you see uh, now you can do the following thing see suppose you, you already know that if you have a function on d2 i can pull it back to give you a function on d1 but suppose i had a function on d2 with a singular point isolated singular point uh, a singularity at w0 okay then uh, by composing with phi i will get a function on d1 which will have an isolated singular point at z0 okay so you see suppose so so the situation is like this you have d2 minus the point w0 and that is being carried over by phi to d1 minus z0 because you know phi is after all bijective it will uh, it will take the complement of z0 uh, to the complement of w0 and z0 will go to w0 so basically what it's doing is that it's taking the punctured domain punctured at z0 and mapping it holomorphically isomorphically analytically isomorphically onto the punctured domain at uh, d2 punctured at w0 okay and suppose you have a function suppose you have a function f here complex valued function okay which is analytic okay then you know if i compose this compose it with phi 
I will get this function g which is uh, first apply phi then apply f okay and of course g will also be analytic okay and mind you this inside this is an open subset this inside this is an open subset the complement of a point is always open and this diagram also commutes okay and uh, well um, the, the, the fact is that um, uh, what this tells you is that f has an isolated uh, the point w0 uh, I do not know whether at the point w0 f is analytic or not okay but in there is a deleted neighborhood of w0 uh, where for example the, the domain d2 minus w0 it is a deleted neighborhood of w0 and there I know f is analytic. So w0 is an isolated singularity of f okay and what this diagram tells you is that uh, the function g that you got by pulling back f via phi is also having an isolated singularity at z0 okay and now you can you can believe that uh, if you believe in this philosophy that under a pullback of functions by an isomorphism okay uh, properties of functions should coincide you can believe that the nature of the singularity of f at w0 should correspond should be exactly the same as the nature of the singularity of, of g at z0 okay. So, uh, it, it's natural to uh, it's natural to expect that if that if f has say a removable singularity at w0, then g should have a removable singularity at z0. If f has a pole at w0 of a certain order, then g will also have a pole at uh, <coughs> uh, z0 of that order. And if f has an essential singularity at w0, then g will have an essential singularity at z0. And the converse will also hold. Okay. So properties of f, uh, this, the nature of the singularity of uh, f at w0 should correspond to the nature should be exactly the same as the nature of the singularity of g at, uh, at z0 okay. So this is something that is uh, that is very easy to understand and uh, and why is this uh, why is that why is that true uh, that is just true because uh, d1 to d2 is an analytic isomorphism okay it is because it is an analytic isomorphism that this is happening see uh, so so let me write this uh, uh, in a in a let me use a different color okay so well so you see so let me write this here uh, uh, nature of the singularity I am abbreviating it as SING of f at uh, w0 is equal to the nature of uh, the singularity of g at w0 okay and see this is uh, th this happens basically because uh, you can you can s you can see this in in a in a, in a moment you see uh, so uh, so why is this true so you know let's look at uh, three cases suppose f is suppose f has a removable singularity at w0 okay then what it means is that uh, you know by riemann's removable singularity theorem you know that the limit of f as uh, w tends to w0 exists this is also the same as saying that uh, the uh, uh, f extends to an analytic function at w0 okay and it is equal to saying that f is continuous at w0 okay and if f is continuous at w0 by composition with phi it is clear that g is also continuous at z0 okay. So, uh, so it is very clear that if f has a removable singularity at w0 then g has a removable singularity at w0 and the converse is also true if g has a removable singularity at z0 then f will have a similar uh, removal singularity at w0 because you can if you compose g with phi inverse you get f okay okay so so this tells you that f has a removal singularity at w0 if and only if g has a removal singularity at z0 okay now what about the case of uh, w0 being a pole if f has a uh, pole at w0 then the limit as w tends to w0 of f is infinity okay and and you know uh, you see by continuity it should happen that uh, g will also have a pole at uh, at z0 is continuous uh, at uh, z0 okay and uh, and g being continuous at z0 is the same as saying that g has uh, a removable singularity at z0 you have this now what is the situation when f has a pole at, z, at w0 f has a pole at 
pole at W naught uh, if and only if you know uh, 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 say uh, of order uh, n uh, greater than or equal to 1 uh, what is the condition for a pole uh, it is uh, well limit uh, that one condition is of course limit z tends to uh, I mean limit w tends to uh, w naught of uh, uh, of uh, f of w should be infinity this is this is one of the conditions of the, and, and that is also uh, the same as saying that uh, limit uh, w tends to w naught of w minus w naught to the power of uh, n times f of w is non zero okay this is exactly the condition that uh, f has a pole of order n okay and you know if you well if you translate if you translate this limit and realizing that as w tends to w tends to w not if and only if z tends to z not because uh, uh, phi is a homeomorphism okay and uh, and you know under a continuous uh, map uh, the image of a, a convergent sequence is again a convergent sequence okay the image of a limit is again a limit all right so you know uh, so if you translate that you will get you will actually if you if you change variables this will tell you that z minus z naught to the power of n uh, g of g of uh, z uh, is uh, is non zero uh, uh, if uh, i if you let z tends to z naught okay so the easiest thing to do is the following thing what you do is you you take this uh, this is the easiest probably this is the easiest thing to do what you do is you put w is equal to phi z Okay, if you put w equal to phi z you will get limit phi z tends to phi z not f of phi of z but f of phi of z is g z okay and limit phi of z tends to phi of z not is the same as limit z tends to z not so you get limit so this is the same as saying that limit z tends to z not uh, g of z is infinity okay see this this is uh, this is plainly equivalent okay so this is what I want so this is what we want so this is uh, this is plainly equivalent to limit uh, z tends to z not uh, g of z is equal to infinity it is just you just make a change of variable from w to uh, z so you will have to so so the so you put w equal to phi z okay uh, then you will get f of phi z f of phi z is just g z by definition okay and uh, w tends to w not will read phi z tends to phi z not but phi z tends to phi z naught is equivalent to z tending to z naught because phi is a homeomorphism so this is the same as this and uh, this condition limit z tends to z naught gz is infinity is uh, uh, will tell you that it is a pole uh, z naught is a pole of g okay and you will have to do a little bit more work to uh, uh, for example compare Laurent series uh, to say that the pole is exactly of the same order uh, on both sides okay so uh, so, uh, so, so you see. The, therefore, uh, essentially, I'm just using the fact that uh, 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 phi is a homeomorphism. I'm not using anything more than that. All right. So, well, so, um, so let me write this here. Uh, G uh, has a pole at z naught, and a little bit more work will tell you that the pole will also have order n. Okay. Um, fine. So, so you know. Uh, you can if you if you try to if you try to uh, if you try to prove this thing uh, below okay uh, that may not be so easy to do uh, at the face of it okay uh, fine so anyway what this tells you is that f has if f has a pole at w naught then g has a pole of at z naught and conversely okay and of course you know you can get the converse because instead of phi you can use phi inverse which is also homeomorphism okay and well uh, and then the, 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 the what is the, the last case is the, the left out case f will have a, a, an essential singularity at w naught if and only if g has an essential singularity at z naught this is just by uh, tautology it is just by logic because uh, essential, uh, essential singularities are singularities which are neither removable nor poles okay and you already shown that removable singularities correspond you have shown that poles correspond therefore essential singularities which is the complement of these two should also correspond okay so let me write that down it it follows uh, that uh, that uh, f has an essential singularity uh, singularity 
at at z not at w not if and only if uh, uh, g has an essential singularity at uh, z not. Okay, this is this is very clear. And in fact, you know, if you want, uh, you can also say it in another way. Uh, what is the condition that? Uh, what is the condition that uh, a function has an essential singularity at that point? Uh, one condition, for example, is that the limit as you approach that point doesn't exist. Okay, if limit is it uh, if if limit w tends to w not f w doesn't exist, then f must have an essential singularity at at w not. And again, you know, if you if you use a substitution w equal to phi z and remember that phi is a homeomorphism, it is very clear that the limit as w tends to w not f w will not exist if and only if the limit as z tends to z not g of z does not exist. And, and this will tell you that uh, w not being an essential singularity for f is the same as z not being an essential singularity for g. Okay, so, essential singularities correspond, but of course, here I am using the fact that the limit does not exist. And, and where did that come from that basically came from an application of uh, actually if you go back it is an application of uh, Riemann's removable singularity theorem which says that if the limit exists then it is removable okay and uh, if the limit exists and it is infinite then it is a pole okay and uh, if the limit does not exist then it is an essential singularity and, and all these ifs are actually if and only ifs okay fine. Now, now having said all this now how do we deal uh, I, I want to get back to try to you know uh, sell you the story that saying that f of z studying f of z at infinity at z equal to infinity is the same as studying f of 1 by z at 0 okay and what is the uh, what why is that justified in light of in the light of this argument. So, it is justified in the following way. So, uh, uh, so, so let me write that down uh, uh, well you know um, uh, justify uh, uh, behavior of f of z. Uh, let me use f of w because for, for so that I am consistent with my notation. Behavior of f of w at w equal to infinity is the same as that of. Uh, uh, f of 1 by uh, w at w equal to 0 okay. So, uh, so this is so if you if you look at a if you have gone through a first course in complex analysis uh, and uh, behavior at infinity was covered then you would see people saying that uh, f has a has a this the nature of the singularity of f at infinity is the same as the nature of singularity of f of 1 by z uh, at 0. Okay, and why is that true? It's true uh, in the in the in the light of the following argument, which is based on what we have been saying. You take this map from C star. Uh, 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 let me not use C star. Take this map from uh, C uh, union infinity, which is extended complex plane to C union infinity. This is the extended complex plane to the extended complex plane. Okay, so now we are making use of the point at infinity, and we are also making use of the topology of the extended complex plane. So, and you know what is the map? The map is just z going to one by z you take this map. So, this is my map phi. So, here my phi of z is 1 by z. So, w uh, is phi of z which is 1 by z. So, w is 1 by z this is my map and this is a well defined map you see uh, th the point is that uh, you, you have to be you have to, you have to just send uh, infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity this is the obvious thing that you will do and uh, uh, so, you know uh, so, so let me write that down you send 0 to the point at infinity and you send infinity to the point at 0 okay and mind you uh, when you send uh, when you make these definitions uh, it phi continues to be a homeomorphism okay. See limit z tends to infinity phi of z is what? Limit uh, uh, z tends to infinity of phi of z is just limit z tends to infinity of 1 by z which is 0 okay. And what this will tell you, uh, uh, so limit z tends to infinity phi of z is 0 and that is phi of uh, that is exactly phi of infinity as per our definition because we have sent infinity to 0. And what does this tell you? This tells you phi is continuous at, at 0 
uh, at, at infinity okay and the same kind of argument will tell you that phi is also continuous at 0. So if you take limit z tends to 0 uh, phi of z is uh, limit z tends to 0 uh, of uh, 1 by z and this is infinity which is phi of 0 okay and mind you this is uh, uh, we have defined what limit z tends to infinity means we have, we have defined what uh, uh, when a limit is infinite we are, we are using all we are using all those definitions we are using uh, the fact that we are, we are thinking of infinity actually as a point okay and we are using uh, and we are also thinking of infinity as a value okay though not a finite value. So the fact is that if you look at this map now from extended complex plane to this extended complex plane z going to 1 over z this is actually a homeomorphism this is the important point it is a homeomorphism and if you throw away both the origin and the point at infinity okay you get C star which is punctured complex plane C minus 0 okay and C minus 0 goes to C minus 0 and if you take if you restrict this map to C minus 0 it is an analytic it is a holomorphic isomorphism that is the point this map is a holomorphic isomorphism which extends to infinity okay so uh, in a continuous way okay so so let me write that down uh, so so let me draw the diagram again so I have the C union infinity here and I have this homeomorphism uh, to C union infinity and this is the map phi uh, which is sending z to 1 over z okay which is w right and what is sitting inside this is uh, c star which is c minus 0 which is a punctured plane and on this side also I have c star uh, that is the image of c star because if z is a non-zero complex number then 1 by z is also a non-zero complex number and this is correspondence is uh, and z going to 1 by z is analytic if z is not 0 because it has the derivative minus 1 over z squared you know that pretty well z equal to 0 is a is a pole of it is a simple pole, pole of order 1 for uh, uh, 1 by z okay. So, so the point is that if you restrict phi to c star what you get here is not just a homeomorphism it is a holomorphic analytic isomorphism so this is a this is so let me write that here it is a holomorphic or analytic isomorphism this is what you get and now watch uh, suppose I have a function which is defined uh, in a neighborhood of infinity okay suppose f is a function which is defined in a neighborhood of infinity what is a neighborhood of infinity a neighborhood of infinity is the exterior of a circle uh, of sufficiently large radius so you know if I have a function uh, defined on mod z say greater than uh, r r sufficiently large this is what a neighborhood of infinity is this is this is a neighborhood so let me let me write that neighborhood of infinity uh, in where this is the neighborhood of infinity in the external complex plane mind you that is how the topology on the external complex plane has been given okay and in in fact it is a uh, if you if you if you look at it uh, in the external complex complex plane then you are including the point at infinity uh, and if you do not include the point of infinity it is a it is a deleted neighborhood okay so since I am looking at it in c star minus 0 it is a deleted neighborhood of the point at infinity okay so this is a deleted neighborhood deleted neighborhood of infin infinity with infinity being deleted okay and uh, and you know under this map z going to 1 over z this should correspond to uh, a, a deleted neighborhood of the origin which is uh, mod z less than 1 by r you know r is sufficiently large so 1 by r is sufficiently small mod z is 1 is less than 1 by r is the uh, so here I probably since my target variable is w I should not have used z let me correct that this should have been w so I have I've reserved uh, w for the target variable and w is uh, so if you plug in there w equal to 1 over z I will get 1 by mod z is greater than r which is the same as saying mod z is less than 1 by r that is a so, so this, this corresponds to mod z less than 1 by r which is a uh, uh, and you know of course uh, this is a this is a neighborhood of the, the origin but if I uh, but since I have not included the point at infinity on the right side uh, I am not uh, this uh, the, the thing that I got get on the left side is going to not include the origin because I am already you know see I am I am considering this as a subset here so infinity is not included and I am considering this as a subset here 
0 is not included. So, this is a deleted neighborhood of the origin. So, this is so let me write this deleted uh, neighborhood of this the origin okay and mind you z going to 1 over z is still a holomorphic isomorphism of uh, this small punctured disc centered at the origin radius 1 by r uh, open disc with the exterior of uh, the disc uh, 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 with the radius r all right. So, now suppose uh, I have a function defined in, an, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood of infinity okay that means I have function f here I have my function f here okay and it is taking complex values all right then if I use so you know this so this so you know this diagram commutes uh, basically this is just uh, this diagram commutes means that I am just restricting the map phi that is all okay. So, this map from uh, this punctured disc uh, surrounding the origin to the exterior of the disc uh, with radius r is uh, is just the holomorphic isomorphism z going to 1 over z which is which we have called as phi okay and you compose that with f you get as before you get g. So, g is just uh, first apply phi then apply f as, as before but what is that. So, you know f is f of w okay and w uh, uh, and and so you see that if if, if, I, if I calculate g of z g of s g of z will then be f of phi of z okay but what is phi of z phi of z is 1 over z so it is so g of z is nothing but f of 1 over z okay. So, so what you see is that if you look at the map z going to 1 over z the pullback of f of uh, w becomes f of 1 over z okay and now you uh, go back to this philosophy that whenever you have uh, an isomorphism of uh, punctured domains and you have an analytic function on the target domain uh, for uh, and you pull it back to an analytic function on the source domain then the nature of the singularity uh, of the function at the target uh, on the on the target space is the same as the nature of the singularity uh, in the source space. So, uh, you know if you apply that philosophy you can see that f is uh, the nature of the singularity of f of w at w equal to infinity is must correspond must be the same as the nature of the singularity of g of z at z equal to 0 but what is g of z g of z is f of 1 by z okay. So, you know this justifies the statement that the nature of the singularity of f of z f of f uh, f of w at w equal to infinity is the same as the nature of the singularity of f of 1 by z at z equal to 0 okay. So, uh, so you must so you, you should understand what is going on uh, why this is a very natural thing to do okay fine. So, uh, uh, so, the moral of the story is that uh, uh, we have a justification as to why studying f at infinity f of w at infinity is the same as studying f of 1 by z at z equal to 0 okay. Now, let us go and try to look at uh, what we are going to get okay uh, and so we will we'll, 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 you know we will get 3 cases uh, uh, as usual because we are uh, we are uh, you know trying to classify the singularity of f at infinity. Mind you in all these things uh, uh, to talk about to be able to talk about these kinds of things fun the function f should be defined in a neighborhood of infinity which means the function should be defined the exterior of a circle okay for all values uh, of uh, the variable in the exterior of a circle of sufficiently large radius okay which is what a neighborhood of infinity is. So, uh, so what is the first what is the first case the first case is uh, when will you say that f has infinity as a removable singularity okay or, or uh, more uh, you know a removable singularity is the same uh, as a point where the function is analytic okay that is exactly what uh, the Riemann's removable singularity theorem says. It says that if, if you take a function which has an isolated singularity at a point in the complex plane then it has a removable singularity at that point if and only if it can be extended to an analytic function at that point and of course the weakest condition is that it is even bounded in a neighborhood of that point that is the strongest <coughs> that is the strongest part of the Riemann's removable singularity theorem. So, I would like to ask when will f uh, be analytic at infinity okay. Now, you know uh, you must be careful when you think about the point at infinity because there are issues. So, for example, you should not be tempted to say that f normally what is the definition of analytic at a point in the complex plane the definition of simplest definition of analyticity is that the function is differentiable at that point and in every neighborhood uh, in, in, in some neighborhood of that point at every point in some neighborhood of that point. 
Now you cannot adapt this definition at infinity you cannot say uh, a function f is analytic at infinity if it is differentiable at infinity and it is also differentiable in the neighborhood of infinity okay that the function is already differentiable in the neighborhood of infinity is given because it is already given to me because infinity is a is an isolated singularity. But trying to say that the function is differentiable at infinity will not make sense because derivative at infinity does not make sense. So what is the derivative at infinity if you really try to define f dash you know f dash of infinity if you want to define it like this naively you will write limit z tends to infinity f of z minus f of infinity divided by z minus infinity which really does not make any sense see f of infinity might make sense because it if, if f if for example f extends to something continuous at infinity f of infinity could be defined as limit z tends to infinity f z okay that is fine but this z minus infinity term is, is absolutely absurd and trying to let z tend to infinity. So you know it is it is uh, you know this is not the uh, this is trying to make f differentiable at infinity is not going to help because there is no way to do it okay. So how will you do it? So the trick is uh, you do it in a in a rather uh, you know indirect way you recall uh, the Riemann's removable singularity theorem which says that if you look at a point in the finite complex plane then the function is analytic there uh, at that point which is an isolated singularity if and only if it is if you want bounded at that point in the neighborhood of that point or if it has a limit at that point which means it extends to a continuous function at that point okay. So you do that so what you do is instead of trying to define the function to be analytic at infinity if it is differentiable at infinity which is wrong because you cannot define the derivative at infinity what you do is you say you define the function to be analytic at infinity if either it is bounded in a neighborhood of infinity or it is uh, uh, it has a limit at infinity namely that it is continuous at infinity okay you make this definition and then you are in very good shape and it will also agree well with both these definitions will agree well with the earlier philosophy that uh, the nature of the singularity at infinity of f of w at infinity is the same as the nature of singularity of f of 1 by z at 0. So you can see that so so here is uh, uh, so define f is uh, analytic at infinity okay uh, so uh, mind you I am uh, so this definition of analytic is very very funny okay it is not the definition that the function is differentiable at that point and differentiable in a neighborhood that point it is not that definition okay but it is the definition that the, that point is a removable singularity okay that is an indirect way of defining it. So f is analytic at infinity so let me write f of w if well uh, uh, limit w tends to infinity f of w exists okay or uh, limit uh, or let me let me write this here um, uh, f uh, is bounded at infinity or f is continuous at infinity okay so and and you know all these things uh, all these things are equivalent these are three different ways of uh, trying to define the function analytic at infinity the 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 philosophy is that you are using uh, uh, you know you, you are using uh, Riemann's removable singularity theorem and why are they equivalent they are equivalent because of the following thing because you see uh, you see this is equivalent to saying that limit z tends to 0 f of 1 by z exists which is which we have called as gz exists because the map z going to 1 over z is a homeomorphism these two are equivalent okay and well f is bounded at infinity is the same as uh, uh, saying that f of 1 by z is bounded at 0 g of z is bound which is defined by f of 1 by z mind you g of z is by our original notation g, g of z is f of phi of z and phi of z is 1 by uh, which is w okay so g is bounded at 0 okay and the third thing is well uh, uh, g of z is equal to f of 1 by z is continuous at 0 and mind you 
all these three are in fact equivalent all these three conditions are equivalent for the function g of z why because now I am looking at a function g of z uh, with 0 as an isolated singularity and all the three conditions are equivalent by Riemann's removable singularity theorem uh, to saying that g is actually uh, having a removable singularity at 0 okay. So these three are these so all these three are equivalent and here this is Riemann's theorem oops so I need to make more space to write down uh, so let me write it here. Uh, so this is by Riemann's theorem on removable singularities and because uh, these three are equivalent therefore these uh, the, the conditions that I have written on the left side are equivalent that is the point I want you to notice. See this is equivalent to this is equivalent to this this is therefore this therefore comes from the right side okay. So, uh, so this will tell you that so you know now we have re reconciled all the definitions f has a removable singularity at infinity if f of 1 by z has a removable singularity at 0 is the same as saying f of 1 by z is analytic at 0 f of 1 by z is continuous at 0 f of 1 by z is bounded in a neighborhood of 0 and you see we have used two things we have used the fact that z going to 1 by z is a homeomorphism and we have also used the fact that uh, we are using the Riemann's removable singularity theorem for a point a singularity in the finite plane okay. So, uh, so we will continue in the next talk.